For anyone who may, wants to make a positive change in their drinking, we support goals of safer drinking or reduced drinking or quitting altogether. It's always up to the individual what to do. Because our organization is called HAMS, our members are called hamsters, <laughs> and there are a few hamsters in this PowerPoint. And our presentation is an alcohol harm reduction self-help manual, and here's the actual physical book. And it's called How to Change Your Drinking. It's a harm reduction guide to alcohol. This is the author. You can get it on Amazon. That's the best place. We make more money from Amazon than other places to buy it. So why do we need a harm reduction approach to alcohol? Well, let's look at some of the different approaches we have. There are moderate drinking programs. There are abstinence-only programs. And then there's the alcohol harm reduction approach. Uh, moderate drinking programs are aimed at people with mild to moderate drinking problems. Uh, moderate drinking programs generally have pretty strict limits. For example, the NIAAA recommends a limit of 14 standard drinks per week, per week for men. That's 14 beers. That's not 14 bar drinks, which bar drinks sometimes have three drinks in them, sometimes they have six drinks in them. Um, for women, the NIAAA recommends a limit of seven, and you know they also say, you must never become intoxicated. You must never exceed the legal limit. You should stay at like 0 .055. And that's for women, they like limit it to three a day and men to four a day. So they're pretty strict limits. Uh, moderate drinking programs uh, also tend to recommend that people with more severe problems uh, seek an abstinence only approach or some other type of approach. Um, outcomes of moderate drinking programs, they tend to have good success rates with mild to moderate problem, problem drinkers. The abstinence only programs are a good fit for people who choose them, but the NIAAA again tells us only 7% of people with an alcohol problem will seek treatment, and studies like that of Jeffrey Bransma show that two-thirds of people will drop out of a 12-step treatment program. So what do we say to everybody else? You need to abstain or die? Um, well. That's not a harm reduction approach. The most appropriate approach for people who are failed by abstinence-only approaches or moderate drinking programs is a harm reduction approach. Um, and uh, we believe that the more alcohol-related problems that a person has, the greater they need, the greater the need for them to practice harm reduction. It's just like uh, the more dope that you shoot, the more clean needles you need. It's, you know, we wouldn't say to people, you have to be a moderate heroin user or we will not give you clean needles. That's not the harm reduction approach. Um, and the same type of compassionate and pragmatic strategies used in harm reduction programs for drugs can also be applied for a harm reduction program for alcohol. Um, harm reduction and intoxication. A harm reduction approach to alcohol does not condemn, intox does not condemn recreational intoxication as a moral failing. We don't view it as a disease. A harm reduction approach recognizes that some people will choose to get intoxicated because they receive certain benefits from doing so. And a harm reduction approach seeks to minimize the risks associated with alcohol use and with alcohol intoxication. So our program, the HAMS program, supports goals of safer drinking, reduced drinking, or quitting alcohol altogether. HAMS encourages individuals to pick goals which they feel are right for them and which they feel they can achieve. HAMS encourages individuals to prioritize goals and elimin eliminate the riskiest behaviors first. HAMS offers 17 optional elements which can be done in any order and a harm reduction toolbox to help people to build their own individualized harm reduction programs. The 17 elements of HAMS. Once again, they're all optional. They can be done in any order. If people can't decide where to start, we say start with one. But if people like want to start with four or three or five or ten, good. Anything that appeals to you is good. Anything to get you involved. Uh, number one is to do a cost-benefit analysis of your drinking. We recommend people write it out. If they don't like to write, they can speak it. Doing it in your head is not so good. Um, then number two, choose a drinking goal of safer drinking, reduced drinking, or quitting. Learn about risk ranking and rank your risks. Learn about HAMS tools and strategies for changing your drinking. Make a plan to achieve your drinking goal. Use alcohol free time 
to reset your drinking habits, learn to cope without booze, address outside issues that affect drinking, then learn to have fun without booze, learn to believe in yourself. Use a chart to plan and track your drinks and drinking behaviors day by day. Evaluate your progress and honestly report your struggles, revise plans or goals as needed. Practice damage control as needed. A uh, more traditional term for this is relapse prevention. But, you know, Alan Marlatt has talked a lot about this. Um, if your goal is abstinence and if you take a drink, what do you do? Do you say, one drink means one drunk, I have to go on a bender for the next 10 years before I can stop again? No, Marlatt says be prepared for this because it happens and be prepared to stop, stop drinking again, you know, get back on the horse and proceed with your goal. And this applies whether you're trying to reduce your drinking, just quit, or to just be safer. Damage control is always important. Number 14 is get back on the horse, get back to what you were doing again. Uh, 15, we recognize that some people, there's a termination stage of change that some people achieve. Uh, some people remain in the maintenance stage of change, if you're familiar with Prochaska stages of change. Some people will, you know, graduate. They will be done with their bad habit. They will be ready to move on with life. They won't want to hang out in a support group anymore. Um, other people will want ongoing support, maybe lifelong. Uh, sometimes people want to come back. Maybe they fixed their alcohol problem. They're happy with their drinking now. They want to work on smoking tobacco, smoking marijuana, something else. Um, everybody's welcome to come back, work on other issues. Some people maybe they decided they wanted to be a safer drinker. They became a safer drinker. Five years later, they say, ah, it's time to cut back. I think I'm doing drinking too much. Well, yeah, come back and cut back. So people are always free to move around. There's none of this, um, you know, if you leave the group, you'll die type of idea. Um, 16, always remember to praise yourself for all your successes. And 17, Move, this is very important, because there's a lot here. Move at your own pace, you don't have to do it all at once. In fact, all the elements are optional. So, people should never feel overwhelmed that there's all these things that they have to do. No, pick the one that you like, start there, do what you're comfortable with, move at your own pace, and do the ones you like, and just leave the others behind. Um, here's an example of a drinking goal worksheet to help people choose their drinking goals. They can write down the advantages of continuing to drink the same as always, uh, the disadvantages of continuing their drinking the same way as always, the advantages of safer drinking, the disadvantages of safer drinking, advantages of reduced drinking, disadvantages of reduced drinking, advantages of quitting, disadvantages of quitting. When people write this out, they make it more clear in their head, and it's also always important to realize People drink because they get benefits from drinking. And if they just write down, drinking is really bad because of this, really bad because of that, all the good stuff stays in the subconscious, and when you least expect it, it comes right out. So it's very important to write down, yes, alcohol has these benefits. This is the reason I like to drink. Alcohol has these disadvantages. These are the reasons I want to change my drinking because this is a problem. This can help people to decide what's their best goal. Do they want to quit? Do they want to cut back? Do they want to be a safer drinker? Or do they want to continue as they always do? Because there is no uh, pressure for anyone to change in any way that they don't want to in our organization, our support group. Um, here's a sample of uh, what one person might write down as some of, their, some of their advantages to continue to drink the same as always. Well, change is hard and change takes effort. Staying where I'm at is easy. I love to get loaded. I'm a romantic. I like to live fast and die young. Maybe think about it. Maybe dying young is not a good goal to have in life. But uh, then you can write down, you know, this person wrote down these disadvantages to continuing to drink the same way as always. Say, so I have a, D, a DUI, and it's going to cost me a fortune. And if I kill someone driving drunk, I could go to prison. I'm afraid my boss might smell alcohol on my breath if I come into work with a big hangover. And I have no time to do anything but drink. So these are some of the things I thought about. Advantages of safer drinking. Won't get another DUI. Won't go to prison for killing someone driving drunk. Won't get my pocket picked in a bar when I'm drunk. Won't get beaten up drunk in a bar. Disadvantages to safer drinking. I always have to plan ahead. 
If I'm drunk, I might forget to be safe. It's a lot of work to plan to overt all the bad things that might happen. You can't be this romantic risk taker. Um, you know, it's really, it's really hard to walk to the bar or take a taxi instead of driving. You know, this might seem silly when you look at it later, but you know, just write down anything that comes to your mind. And don't worry if it's silly, not silly, just writing it out gets it out of your brain into the objective world, and then it helps you to deal with it. And uh, I'll move on a little quicker. 